Hello, my name is Sean, and I am an alcoholic and an addict. And I thought, obviously, I thought how to do that. I thought about how to introduce myself. Should I say that, given a room full of well-adjusted, well-balanced, otherwise healthy adults, maybe even especially in a professional setting, in a public speaking setting, in a business setting, but I decided to for certain reasons, and I think in a little bit, I hope it actually helps or becomes clear. I don't know. But I'm going to take another run at the introduction. Hello, my name is Sean Hossman, and I am the president and owner of a company that works closely with criminal justice. Years ago, I developed a passion for human services, and I think criminal justice is about human services. And the work that I've done that becomes relevant to some of the ideas I want to share is around improving that criminal justice system, actually taking the men and women that are in the criminal justice system, understanding that we have them for a time, and like we've heard here today in several different iterations, giving them back to society, their families and their communities, somehow better equipped, better able, better um, taught, better skilled at succeeding. So when I've tried to do that, there's a couple of ways you could. You could work directly with offenders, one-on-one, -on -one, in a direct service. I decided to create a company that focused on numbers and research and evidence and data and outcomes and try to do it in the aggregate. I tried to work with state and local criminal justice agencies, probation, parole, prison, sheriff, um, jails, maybe even institutions. And in some way, I focused on and beat a singular drum. Data, data, evidence, proof. You show me if it works. I don't care what you say it is. If you can demonstrate the numbers in aggregate, I'll believe it, and we'll see if we can't implement it with some fidelity. So my ability to work with people, not the directly with the offenders, but the officers, the correctional staff that works with the offenders. I wanted to improve their skills. I wanted to improve their tools. I wanted to show them what worked best and what didn't work at all, or what might work better. And in doing that, I had to almost give up or fight against what we call the anecdote, the classic story, the story that we use all too often to either set policies about a particular horrible crime or even on the other side of a particular great person and so we're going to then treat everybody else the way that person was treated or because of that story, the dreaded anecdote. And because that's kind of what happened with the anecdote or my story, I'm going to tell you my story because I've learned a little bit. And after years and years of beating a very particular drum about data and evidence and outcomes and results and numbers, I believe now, because of my own story, I'm more willing to listen to more stories. And then I'll get back to aggregating those into, the, into maybe the, uh, you know, the outcomes that we need. So um, I created a company. And as I flew around a lot, I decided, even though it seemed like I had it all, I had a beautiful wife, I had beautiful children, I had a beautiful house, I had investments, I owned a company, I had employees. I was, not to be rude, but I was a white American male. And in and of that itself, there was some success and I had a future. I was healthy, I had good, everything going on. However, as I traveled and built my business, I started drinking. And I traveled on planes. And I'll tell you the number one cause of drinking, I'm pretty sure, is first class. <laughs> <clears throat> And I'd like those folks <clears throat> to be sat down and talked to. But anyway, <laughs> the point is in hotels and with clients, and I entertained, and I worked, and I worked hard, and I did this all over the country, from Delaware to California, from Washington down to Florida, Texas, Iowa, et cetera. And I was on the road a lot. But for whatever reason, that's a different time and a different story, I drank too much. And that's clear. And as I started to drink too much, I even started to drink alone. But I still kept building my business, and it kept working, and I kept doing good work. Then, though, something happened, like in everybody's life, there was a moment of some type of tragedy. For me, it was a very massive tragedy, unexpected and successive loss. And when that happened, I did what I had learned to do to deal with stress. I drank. Only this time it didn't work. So this time it actually went further and turned to drugs. And again, you might wonder, why are you saying that up here? I'm going to make a very short point. So I'm not going to drag you through the details at all, but I'm going to have you fast forward with me months later. And very quickly, right, they took their hold. And in the scene that I'm about to explain, I am sitting cross-legged on the floor that used to have linoleum on it, but doesn't even have that anymore. And I'm in a very dangerous apartment 
I'm in a very dangerous apartment building, I'm in a very dangerous part of town, and I'm in one of the United States' most dangerous cities. And I'm sitting cross-legged by myself on the floor, holding my breath and trying very hard to be still. Because I have someone three times, two or three times my size, walking around me in a circle. And if I tried to make this next piece up, I couldn't. In one hand, they had a massive, sharp, wicked-looking machete. And in their other hand, they had a leather long bullwhip. And they were circling me on this floor for three hours, telling me that if I moved or spoke or made a sound, what would happen to me, and threatening me with all kinds of bad news stuff. And here's the funny part about that. <laughs> I sat there, and do you want to know what I thought in my head at that moment? I thought, you know what? I might have a drug problem. <clears throat> and here's the reason I want to tell you that story. And I know it's tough, and I know it's uncomfortable. And here's the reason why I took you through some of my sort of boring professional experience, and why I've taken you through sort of a horrifying personal experience is because when I sat there and I did decide, oh my gosh, I've got a problem, I, it clicked in my head and I said to myself, I'm done, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna stop. It's over this horrible ride. And I knew in my head that once I said it, that was gonna happen. So I leave that place, luckily I do make that alive. But you know what happened next? More horrifying than what had happened on that kitchen floor? I couldn't stop. I couldn't quit. And I'm not going to get into that point, but I'm going to talk about something, about the, what you'll hear in the substance abuse industry called incomprehensible demoralization. Because there is a moral decay from this concept, from these drugs. And if we're thinking for a second, why is he talking about drugs again? We're talking about like new advancements. Let's go back to drugs two seconds. It's maybe as high as 89% of your population. Either addiction, distribution, or other crimes committed in order to support a habit. Right? The International Community Corrections Association says that 70 to 80 percent of our America's inmates are in need of substance abuse treatment. Down the road at the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, they say that over 60 percent of our inmates need substance abuse treatment. So man, it's the drugs. And it's a lot of it. So I'm going I'm to get back to what happens with them. I couldn't quit. How many people can quit? How many people can't quit? And there is, bringing the research back to you now, there is something that happens in that last piece, that you've had this struggle, right? And you can't make it on your own. And that's a reality. And let me tell you why. Let's talk about change for a second. Let me go back to the research. I've spent my career in change. I've changed systems. I've changed agencies. I've changed programs. I've changed practice. I've changed and improved. I've been in the change, organizational system reform, change business. And how difficult is it to change? And I'll look out with all of you, and I got folks that are living inside here, and I got folks that are working here, and I got folks that are living outside here. And when was the last time any of you tried to change your weight, tried to change your smoking, tried to change your attitude, tried to change your position in life, tried to change your exercise regimen, tried to change your relationship, tried to change your better father, mother, friend, it's hard. Now try doing that when you have mentally, emotionally, and physically decimated yourself. And then you got to change, and from something that's got a hold like no other, no other. So here's the thing about that. In this industry of change, there is a seminal book and a seminal sort of philosophy called motivational interviewing. I'm not going to deal with it a whole lot right now, but I'm going to pull one sort of particular idea out about it. And in a weird way, the research, and I'm talking about 50 languages that the book's been republished in, I'm talking about worldwide sort of saturation of the research and the number of studies around how people change, and in particular with substance abuse, an odd, funny little three words comes up. And it's something you hear all the time. Are you ready? Are you willing? Are you able? Ready, willing, able. It's colloquial, it's common, it's something we talk about all the time. Ready, willing, and able, I'm there except the research behind every one of those words is extensive. And ready means priority. You're going to do it now. Willing means important. You value why you have to. An able man, able means confidence that you can. And going back to my linoleum floor, my absolutely, I was done. I knew in my head I'd never do it again because I just about died and I was finished. And I'm kind of a pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of guy. 
I ain't playing with you, right? Like, I'm an, I can do this. I got this. I created my own company. I created my own success. I had a great life, right? But when I figured out I was unable to do it, then I go back to ready, willing, and able. If you don't have all three of those things, if you only have two of the three, if you have ready and willing but not able, if you have able and ready but not willing, if you have willing and able but not ready, I'll give you examples. You won't get change. You won't get change out of our offenders. You won't get change out of folks on the inside, outside, any of you. So if you're not able, what do you do? And I'll tell you how I'm alive. Frankly, I won't bore you again with a lot of the sort of details. But I, at this point in my life, I had burned out everybody. I would chewed up my family. I would chewed up people close to me. I would chewed up parents. I would chewed up friends. I would burnt out anyone associated with me. I would burnt out colleagues and associates, right? I was done. I was solo. I was profoundly alone, right? This is, and, and a lot of our folks are there. Hell, I'd even messed up or burnt out the addicts and the alcoholics that I knew. <laughs> so what was I going to do now? So somebody walked into my life, and I won't get into all the details, and just said, I'm standing here before you, and I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to walk out. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to criticize. And I'm going to help your otherwise anemic, ridiculous, unproductive self just for a little while. And that is called enabling. And my, one of my ideas today to share is ready, willing, and enabled. Because at that point, when you're ready... Because you are, man. When you're willing, oh yeah, you're willing. Are you able? Not so much if you've gone a path similar to a lot of our substance abuse issues or substance abuse folks. And the word enabling is negative. It means dysfunctional. It means giving you too much, maybe keeping it going, maybe even hurting you, maybe being codependent. There's so many words. I want to turn it on its head. I want to think of the word enabling as empowering. And these folks need empowering. I'm working now in my business and doing my research and doing all of that and software and outcomes, but I'm also now working hands-on with felons and addicts. I took five felons and addicts, recovering addicts, fishing last Saturday, one week ago today. And you'll learn a lot when you take a bunch of just fresh felons fishing. <laughs> and one of them was Make sure kind of you're standing by yourself when you say, hey, who's got a knife? That was. <clears throat> but I'm working directly with them, and I want them enabled. And I want us to think enabling. And I want to get rid of the negative connotation of enabling. And I want to enable addicts and felons. And here's how long you got to enable them for. It's not the rest of their lives. The research is clear. So I'll end with this. There is a cycle of readiness for change. We all go through it. It's like the stages of grief, right? One of those steps, by the way, is relapse. It is as much a stage of change as any of the other stages. It's normal, and you got to get through it. But the other one is maintenance, and the research is pretty clear, right? This is aggregate numbers again. You get somebody to develop that good habit for about six months, and that's all they need. They'll get off and running. But in that six-month period, I've got guys that literally can't find their birth certificate. They don't know where their Social Security card is. They don't know where they were born. They don't have a driver's license. And they can't cope. So like me the other day, talking to one of my friends, actually, in here, I told him a story about how I woke up one morning just in the early stages of my recovery a few years ago. And my coffee maker wouldn't give me coffee. And I was pretty sure it meant like it was intentional. So I spent about 17 minutes struggling with my coffee maker. I beat it up. I literally poured it in the sink and threw water in it. I threw it on the floor. I couldn't cope. So there is an enabling that I want folks to do for people. And you don't got to do it forever. Six months, maybe. I want you to think of it as a positive. Get them past that step. And they'll figure it out from there. That's it. Thank you.